Charles Dickens' classic ghost story. When a traveller chances upon a solitary railway signalman, he is drawn into a tale of ghostly premonitions, tragic occurrences and human solitude that echoes the contrasting Victorian feelings towards the nascent railway system. Beware the ringing of the signalman's bell. Helloa! Below there! When I first saw the man, he was standing at the door of his box, with a flag in his hand furled round its short pole. One would have thought, considering the nature of the ground, that he could not have doubted from what quarter the voice came. But instead of looking up to where I stood on the top of the steep cutting nearly over his head, he turned himself about and looked down the railway line. There was something remarkable in his manner of doing so, though I could not have said for my life what. But I know it was remarkable enough to attract my attention, even though his figure was foreshortened and shadowed down in the deep trench, and mine was high above him, so steeped in the glow of an angry sunset, that I had shaded my eyes with my hand before I saw him at all. Hello! Uh, below! Is there any path by which I can come down and speak to you? I say, is there a safe route down? After a pause, during which he seemed to regard me with fixed attention, he motioned with his rolled up flag towards a point on my level some two or three hundred yards distant. I found a rough zigzag descending path notched out, which I followed. The cutting was extremely deep and unusually precipitate. It was made through a clammy stone that became oozier and wetter as I went down. As I descended, I recalled a singular air of reluctance or compulsion with which the man had pointed out the path. When I came down low enough upon the zigzag descent to see him again, I saw that he was standing between the rails on the way by which the train had lately passed, in an attitude as if he were waiting for me to appear. He had his left hand at his chin and that left elbow rested on his right hand crossed over his breast. His attitude was one of such expectation and watchfulness that I stopped a moment, wondering at him. I resumed my downward way and Stepping out upon the level of the railroad and drawing nearer to him, saw that he was a dark, sallow man with rather heavy eyebrows. His post was in as solitary and dismal a place as ever I saw. On either side, a dripping wet wall of jagged stone, excluding all view but a strip of sky. The perspective one way, only a crooked prolongation of this great dungeon. The shorter perspective in the other direction, terminating in a gloomy red light, and the gloomier entrance to a black tunnel, in whose massive architecture there was a barbarous, depressing and forbidding air. So little sunlight ever found its way to this spot, that it had an earthy, deadly smell, and so much cold wind rushed through it, that it struck chill to me, as if I had left the natural world, this is a lonely place to occupy. I suppose a visitor is a rarity down here. He directed a most curious look towards the red light near the tunnel's mouth and looked all about it as if something were missing from it and then looked at me. The light over there by the tunnel is part of your charge, is it not? Don't you know it is? The monstrous thought came into my mind as I perused the fixed eyes and the saturnine face that this was a spirit, not a man. I have speculated since whether there may have been infection in his mind. You look at me as if you feared me. I was doubtful whether I'd seen you before. He pointed to the red light he had looked at. There? Yes. <laughs> My good fellow, what should I do there? However, be that as it may, I never was there. You may swear. I think I may. 
Yes, I'm uh, sure I may. His manner cleared. He replied to my remarks with readiness and in well-chosen words. Have you much to do here? Yes, sir. That is to say, I have enough responsibility to bear. Exactness and watchfulness are what is required of me. I have next to no manual labour to change that signal, to trim those lights, and to turn this iron handle now and again. No doubt your job entails many long and lonely hours spent in these rather damp and gloomy conditions. Indeed. Yet, it has become part of my routine and I've grown used to it. I've taught myself a language down here. I've also worked at fractions and decimals and tried a little algebra, but uh, I'm a poor hand at figures. Is it necessary for you, when on duty, always to remain in this channel of damp air? That, sir, depends on time and circumstance. But surely you can sometimes get out from down here. You must get precious little sunshine. Under some conditions, there will be less upon the line than under others, and the same holds good as to certain hours of the day and night. There was a time, if the weather was bright, when I might choose to ascend from these lower shadows. But it's the bell, you see. The bell? I'm at all times liable to be called by the electric bell. The anxiety caused by listening out for the bell is magnified the further I move from the signal box. But, but the cold and clamminess of this paper... The bell! It never leaves me. It's constantly with me. Forgive me, sir. Please, won't you join me inside? I keep a good fire. You'll soon feel the benefit of it. He took me into his box, where there was a fire, a desk for an official book in which he had to make certain entries, a telegraphic instrument with its dial, face and needles, and the little bell of which he had spoken. From the manner in which you speak, I cannot help thinking that you are well educated and, if I may say without offence, educated above the station to which you now find yourself. Such instances, I am sure, are to be found among many others. I have heard it is so in workhouses, in the police force and even the army. When I was young, I had been a student of natural philosophy and had attended lectures. But, sir, I did run wild and misused my opportunities. Consequently, I found myself a signalman down here and have barely risen since. I offer no complaint. I've made my bed and now must lay upon it. It is far too late to make another. Dare I say you appear to be a contented man? A contented man? Tell me, sir, would you say that you were a contented man? I rather suppose I would. I have a modest income, uh, friends to socialise with, whilst also enjoying my own company. Long walks in the fresh air, hearty meals. Uh... Then, truly you are a contented man. A man who sleeps with an easy conscience, I dare say. To whom slumber comes readily and peacefully. <laughs> The bell, sir. Won't you excuse me a moment? He was several times interrupted by the little bell and had to read off messages and send replies. Once he had to stand without the door and display a flag as a train passed and make some verbal communication to the driver. In the discharge of his duties, I observed him to be remarkably exact and vigilant, breaking off his discourse at a syllable and remaining silent until what he had to do was done. I must say you are remarkably exact and vigilant, although I have known you but this past hour. You appear to be one of the safest men to be employed thus. I merely do my job, sir. Come, come. You do yourself an injustice. It is a huge responsibility having to be alert at all times. I should imagine an accident on the train line would be a terrible thing. A derailment, for instance, or a collision. <laughs> I shudder to think what carnage a collision inside the tunnel would cause. A tunnel collision is the worst, sir. It is the shape of the tunnel, you see. The lack of space. The wreckage becomes horribly compressed. And the tunnel itself becomes a flue for the flames. 
You can imagine the effect of this on those trapped inside, bone crushed beneath metal, flesh ripped to the bone. It's... You were saying? While he was speaking to me, he twice broke off with a fallen colour, turned his face towards the little bell when it did not ring, opened the door of the hut, which was kept shut to exclude the unhealthy damp, and looked out towards the red light near the mouth of the tunnel. On both of those occasions, he came back to the fire with the same inexplicable air upon him. Is everything all right? You remarked before, sir, that you felt I am a contented man. I believe I used to be. But I'm troubled, sir. I am troubled. With what? What is your trouble? It is very difficult to impart, sir. If ever you make me another visit, I will try to tell you. But I expressly intend to make you another visit. Say, when shall it be? I go off early in the morning, and I shall be on again at ten tomorrow night. I will come at eleven. Are you absolutely sure everything is as it should be? I'll show my white light, sir, until you've found the way up. When you have found it, don't call out. And when you're at the top, don't call out. Very well. And when you come tomorrow night, don't call call out. Before you leave, what made you cry holloa below there tonight? Heaven knows. I mean, I cried something to that Not to that I... effect, sir. Those were the very words. I know them well. No, I said them, no doubt, because I saw you below. For no other reason? Oh, what other reason could I possibly have? You had no feeling that they were conveyed to you in any supernatural way? No. Good night, sir. The signalman held up his light. I walked by the side of the down line of rails with a very disagreeable sensation of a train coming behind me until I found the path. It was easier to mount than to descend, and I got back to my inn without any adventure. My landlady was waiting for me. Here's meat and vegetables, sir. I kept it warm for you. I was unsure what time you'd be back. My afternoon stroll took longer than I anticipated. It's a cold day for walking. You'll be ready for a hot meal and a fire. And a warm bed, I dare say. The clamminess in the air by the railway tunnel seems to have precipitated a slight wheeziness. Whatever possessed you to go walking down there? And with all these beautiful fields and meadows, you could have strolled along. Mark my words, sir. It's dangerous by that there railway line. Those engines come hurtling along like... The hands of hell spew in the devil's own smoke. I assume you are not a proponent of the railways, Mrs Marsh. That I'm not, sir. She don't seem natural. All those folks squeezed inside a metal box. Not that the likes of me could afford to use them. They're the preserve of the rich. They say the railways are helping connect people. Allowing people the opportunity to visit towns and cities they'd never otherwise see. Creating new experiences. Well, that's what they want us to think. To justify all that time and money they spent burrowing into the earth. If God had wanted us to travel, he would have given us wheels. Oh, but surely the steam trains allow us to transport goods and materials quickly and efficiently. A coal, wood... But that's as may be. But not people. I think the people who use the railways rather enjoy doing so. Will you try telling that to those poor unfortunates who were travelling the day of the train crash last year? Not one mile away from here it happened. Men, women, children. You could hear the cries of panic coming from the railway line. They brought the wounded here. They heard him out on the floor. It was more like a hospital than an inn. I suppose accidents, however tragic, are always going to happen. The cost of progress. I've said enough. Forgive me, sir. Your dinner will be getting cold. I'll fetch you another drink. <laughs> 